The Carleton College Convocation Program is a weekly lecture series that brings fresh insights and perspectives from experts in a variety of fields. The program has a rich history dating back several decades. The selected convocation speakers assist the liberal arts mission of centering thoughtful conversations within education and beyond. Good morning and welcome. I'm Adrian Balbuena in the class of 2024. I'm majoring in Cinema and Media Studies with a minor in Gender, Women, and Sexuality Studies. I am excited and honored to introduce today's convocation speaker, Diana Fraser. Diana is a Carleton alum who recently graduated in 2014. She earned a bachelor's degree in Cinema and Media Studies and is currently an Emmy-nominated documentary director. She is a 2021 Online News Association Women's Leadership Accelerator cohort member and a 2018 Minnesota State Arts Board grant recipient. She holds many other titles, including program director, line producer, creative strategist, and content producer. As a line producer for Twin Cities PBS, her programs received 20 Emmy Award nominations and nine wins. Diana's much admired portfolio consists of a Princess Grace Honorarium Award film, two feature films, and several festival-recognized short films. Her work centers on intersectional feminist, health, and LGBTQ stories. She thus spotlights marginalized and underrepresented voices, aiming to ignite social dialogue and creative col collaboration. Her directorial debut and Emmy-nominated nominated documentary is called Patient No More. This film reveals the stories and experiences of many LGBTQ plus women who face many challenges and obstacles across healthcare systems. Diana's films focuses on LGBTQ plus issues that are hardly spoken about, including mental health, pregnancy, insurance, coming out, medical racism, lesbian organizing, organizing and trans healthcare. Last night, we had a campus-wide screening of her film, Patient No More, and to set the stage for her talk, we're going to start with the film trailer. I always talk to myself before I go in and deal with the medical world by saying, I am the one who is paying the money. I am the one that is hiring these people to take care of me. Therefore, I'm the one in charge. The Affordable Care Act, passed by the Obama administration, set a few precedents saying that it was illegal to discriminate based on gender identity um, and sexual orientation. When we talk about repealing Obamacare, not much of that discourse relates to the fact that it would be rolling back an enormous civil rights statute. It was the greatest expansion of civil rights since the Civil Rights Act in the 1960s. It brought those same sorts of anti-discrimination protections to the realm of healthcare. It's so easy to forget LGBTQ folks when we don't talk about pride or when we don't talk about like gay bars or you know things that people think of when they think of LGBT folks. Everything in healthcare is um, patterned after uh, gender binary after cis-normative uh, ideas and heteronormative ideas. Inherently, what the medical profession would define as risk is just like my life and the way I am, mm -hmm. but they're, they call it risky. Mm -hmm. And that has always been to me like, whatever you define as risk is obviously not what I define as risk. And regardless, I get to decide how much risk I take. In my experience doing research, a lot of the issue around queer women's healthcare and information around that isn't that the information is bad, it's just that the information isn't there. Kind of like categorized as this like mystical group of people. Basically we need queer women to make studies about queer women because what's happening right now isn't doing a good job. I, I don't think I, my imagination has gotten to the point of envisioning queer women's medicine. I want to. How do we remain stable and survive in this world that we're given, this world that we try to navigate.
Please join me in welcoming Diana Fraser back to Carleton College. excited to be here with you today. I went to Convo and Convo Lunch nearly every single week between 2010 and 2014, so I know that those of you who chose to attend or tune in today are definitely kindred spirits and most likely fellow nerds, so thank you for coming. I'd like to start by expressing my gratitude to the college and the people behind the scenes who brought me here today. Receiving an invitation to come to campus as a convocation speaker is a tremendous honor, and I'm grateful for their generosity and support of Patient No More and me. Patient No More's origin story is a long and winding one. Almost a decade before I ever dreamt of making Patient No More, I watched all 15 seasons of ER during high school and then immediately started volunteering at my local hospital for the next three years. ER, Grey's Anatomy, and volunteer work inspired me to become an empathetic provider. Patients were more than statistics. Their stories mattered. The story starts here because I want you to remember that inspiration can come from a lot of places, but it almost always comes from art. ER transformed my understanding of the world and myself, and every time I go back to it, I learn something new about myself, the characters, and the world we live in. Pay attention to the art that shaped you. Tell people about the art that inspires you. Stories are powerful, and they can change the world, whether fiction or nonfiction. Today I'm going to share a few stories of my own. I learned a lot while making Patient No More on purpose and by accident. And in the grand scheme of things, making a movie is remarkably similar to getting any passion project off the ground. It is ultimately about inspiration, people, stories, goals, and trial and error. Today I wanna to go behind the scenes to talk about the importance of audience, resources, networking, and the inevitability of surprises. Your path doesn't have to follow mine, and in fact, it probably won't. But I hope that sharing what I learned will help give you some blueprints to achieve your own dreams, or at the very least, help you put on your shoes to get on out the door. For expediency, I'm going to start at the end. As of 2023, Patient No More is now an Emmy-nominated Emmy documentary available for streaming. <laughs> Thank you. Um, available for streaming and broadcast nationwide via PBS. It has screened at over 30 major medical institutions, including Harvard Medical School, UCLA Medical School, the 2020 World Professional Association for Transgender Health, as well as other hospitals and clinics around the country, and film festivals. It is available to universities via ProQuest and programmed in medical continuing education. This all started when I had a pipe dream at 24. Two years later, in 2018, I received a tiny $10,000 grant from the Minnesota State Arts Board. My original goal was that one queer kid would see this film and know that they deserve dignity and safety in all medical spaces. It has gone so much further <laughs> and done so much more than I could have ever imagined. Like many dreams, Patient No More started with a lot of no. <laughs> to be honest, so much of the journey is so frustrating. <laughs> you have an idea and you tell someone about it and they say no. <laughs> And then you write a grant about how cool it will be. And they say no. And you do that on repeat. No, no, maybe, but I can't fund it right now. Um, no, no, maybe, yes, but I can only give you $10,000. 
okay, well, maybe I can make this on the cheap. Will you help me and be on my crew? No, <laughs> no, <laughs> no, yes, maybe. Um, but I can only give you evenings or weekends. Getting things off the ground is the hardest part of any dream. But what I learned is that if I was willing to hear no over and over again, then I was willing to ask the question enough times to hear someone say yes. Hearing people say no so often was also a really good indicator that I needed to hone my pitch. In order to tell a good story, I needed to understand my audience. I needed to do a deep dive into the market landscape so that I could explain the film's relevancy. I needed to be able to convince someone why they should, as a funder, viewer, buyer, interviewee, care about this topic. Why should they prioritize watching my film? I needed to ask if anything else existed like it in the market. Did something similar come before it? How did my idea feel new or fresh? In 2016, there was literally nothing like this circulating in long-form doc film or medical schools at the time. So I had a compelling and original story to add to the conversation. At the time, medical journals and major news outlets like the Journal of Pain, the New York Times, the Atlantic, had just started to write about doctors' routine misdiagnosis of women's pain and symptoms. And these articles, of course, were talking about white, straight, cis women's health. We were nowhere near intersectional queer women's health. Likewise, most medical schools didn't even have a queer health elective class, much less actual curriculum. And fun fact, most still don't. Similarly, this is years before disclosure, sex education, Heartstopper, or the L word Gen Q. Queer women rarely saw ourselves on screen with any regularity, and we certainly didn't see ourselves talking exclusively to one another about healthcare dilemmas. My idea for a documentary about queer women's access to healthcare filled a gap and cut through the noise with its specificity. I wanted to make a film that centered the lived experiences of queer women patients and providers for the first time. And I wanted to center a diverse and queer film crew. Boom. Now I can sell why the film is important and relevant. I want to make a film by queer women, about queer women, for queer women, with queer women. And that is when I finally landed the grant. Next up, I needed to define my audience. The number one rule of audience is you make something for everyone, you make something for no one. Identifying a target audience is a critical first step for any project. I personally narrowed the field and chose queer women as my North Star with medical professionals as my secondary audience. But what kind of questions would you ask to learn more about those audiences? Queer women and medical professionals are pretty broad, right? How do you define queer? How do you define women? When you're thinking about medical professionals, are they students? Are they teaching? Are they residents? Do they have a specialty? All of these were really great starting points to get at who my core audience was, what they wanted, and what they were interested in. As a queer woman, I was most interested in and qualified to share queer women's experiences. But as we pointed out earlier, how do you define queer women? I settled on centering folks who felt they self-identified as queer or under the LGBTQIA umbrella and identified as a woman at the time of filming. Medical professionals of all ages and stages would be my secondary audience because we wanted healthcare professionals to treat us differently, namely better, <laughs> in healthcare settings. And now that I had a target audience, I had to be deliberate about reaching and serving them. I needed to be constantly curious Instead of expecting people to watch my movie, I had to ask why they would want to watch my movie. What resonates with them? 
Can they see themselves in the film? Are these new or old stories? Are there inside jokes so they know it's for them? What do they remember when it's over? It was also important to consider how my target audiences would be represented, aka seen and heard, in all aspects of the work. So step two is representation. On screen, I decided the overwhelming majority of interviews would be by queer women as patient and provider. Because why would I, a queer woman, want to be straight-splained or mansplained about my own issues? Instead, there are 17 queer women on camera with only two men, one gay male talking about lesbians during the Minnesota AIDS crisis, and Barack Obama. It's also critical to consider if and how somebody's story is compounded by intersectional identities. Then, take into consideration which ones add nuance to the story. No creator will ever have everyone represented, and I barely had enough money to make the film with as many interviews as I did. But with the resources that you do have, try to include a range of life experiences. For instance, everyone in the film spoke to at least two of their identities, being non-binary and lesbian, being an intersex trans elder, or a Latina trans woman. The queer women community is deep and broad and deserves to see our complexities on screen telling our own stories. One of the things I'm proudest of is that there are more queer women in this documentary than I have ever seen on television at once outside an episode of The L Word. <laughs> I also believe that inclusive storytelling is the only kind worth making, and walking the talk was a really important part of this work. So off screen, I was really deliberate about my crew selection because I wanted to make sure that my set reflected as, much, as many POV of the types of diverse of queer women as I could afford to film, and as many types of diverse creators as I could afford to pay. One of the ways that I did that was by deciding I would hire and film more than 50% BIPOC folks, queer folks, and folks with disabilities. I've read that the typical Hollywood movie is usually about 30%. Patient No More was 90%. I also assembled an advisory board of 25 people, including queer women, public health professionals, and media producers, some of whom are here today, to become sounding boards. Because documentary work embraces the idea that you don't and can't know everything. And so as sounding boards, they became well, sounding boards. They were sounding boards who offered advice and perspective to challenge and uplift the work. There was one more experience that was extremely helpful and humbling as a director. Early on, my advisors encouraged me to consider being in the film myself. Wanting to make this film had come from a deeply personal place, and they thought I could serve the story well. I wasn't sold on the idea yet, but I figured it couldn't hurt to have the footage. And that particular day, my crew was primarily straight, cis, and male. And when I sat down in the chair to be interviewed, I immediately felt myself start to clam up. And these guys were friends, but they weren't queer. They weren't nodding their head along as I told stories about myself because they hadn't had those experiences. I kept looking for the other woman in the room looking for solidarity, as I naturally became very protective of my experiences and I filtered out my thoughts. Unsurprisingly, that interview ended up on the cutting room floor. But this only reinforced that my set needed to be inclusive, well represented with various identities, and that extra care needed to be taken to make sure that everyone felt comfortable, heard, seen, and grounded on set. These are things good directors do anyway, but this experience emphasized to me that comfort was paramount if folks were going to be sharing vulnerable stories. 
Before we began, I encouraged every interviewee to tell me if we needed to stop, pause, restart, or strike a story from the record. These were their stories, joys, fears, fights, and triumphs and they needed to feel empowered and respected at all stages of the interview process. In the end, it felt like everyone lit up with excitement to talk about hard stuff with me, which is such a gift as a director. And this brings us to step three. I had all these goals with my target audience and I had thought deeply about how I was going to get them on camera and behind the scenes, but how was I going to live those values and stay accountable in the edit to the queer women and the medical professionals that I was trying to serve? There was one scene in particular towards the end of the film that I had to decide whether to keep or delete due to time and format, and I really wasn't sure what to do. My queer women and medical professionals Professionals were just like, oh my God, this is so powerful. I love it. I've never seen anything like it. Is there more? I could watch an hour of this. The act of listening, mwah. But the media advisors were like, eh. It's kind of repetitive to things that you've already pointed out. It breaks format with the round table style. You're close on time. I don't know, I think I'd cut it. So if we go back to the beginning and we think about our target audience, are we gonna keep the segment the queer women and medical professionals love or toss it because the media people say that it's unnecessary? The advisory board helpfully affirmed that the message superseded the technical style in this instance and that centering my target audiences meant keeping it in. This section went on to be nearly everyone's favorite part of the film, including mine, the section I received the most positive comments about. Someone told me that it was transformational to see queer women of color be the experts of their own stories unfiltered. And that is why learning the market, defining your audience, and staying accountable to them is critical. If there is a pillar to getting anyone to believe in a good idea and getting people to engage with that idea, it's serving your audience, always. The second piece of the puzzle is about resources. Generally, resources are parameters you have to operate within to meet your goal. I didn't have a million dollars, so I couldn't set out to make a Netflix movie. I had $10,000, and gosh, it goes fast after taxes. With those funds, I carved out chunks to pay, reduced rates for crew and gear, some footage licensing fees, craft services and mileage, and then a little bit of marketing money. A film like this would normally cost at bare minimum $60,000, <laughs> so I had to get creative. There are always a million choices to make when getting a dream off the ground, including choices about those choices. Which constraints go front and center? Which ones become second string? And which ones are just pipe dreams and stretch goals? The good news is that once you have those tiers of constraint in mind, you can make smart, deliberate choices and mistakes about how you'll move forward. In my case, once I had this teeny tiny grant, I had to consider how I would actually make the dang thing. And my questions were an endless stream of consciousness. Who is going to be my crew? How am I going to pay them? How, how much am I going to pay them? What trade-offs can I live with for the things that I cannot afford? How many shoot days do I need? Can I film in a hospital or a clinic? Whose permission do I need to do that? Do HIPAA laws? prevent me from doing that? Do I need a lawyer? I can't afford a lawyer. <laughs> How am I gonna shoot the interviews? Can I do that in a coffee shop? Can I do it in somebody's home instead? What is my backup plan? What is my plan? It turns out that you can indeed film in a hospital without needing a lawyer, 
but you will have to film in the lobby on the third floor of the specialty center and ask questions around the arrival and departure of families and babies arriving for their appointments. But in that same vein, if you, you always have to remember that if you are making a passion project on the cheap, you're probably going to have to compromise. In my case, it would have been astronomically expensive and legally complicated to film in hospitals with our patients and their providers. So I didn't. And I focused on finding great storytellers the audience would be engrossed by, making those interviews look beautiful in locations that we could afford, and paying for important footage licensing and animation when we couldn't be walking and talking around in medical spaces, but still needed to illustrate that point. Having a steady job also allowed me to forgo pay to make this all happen while still being able to afford food and rent. I have a whole soapbox about asking marginalized identities to make art about marginalized people for free or by underpaying marginalized people who are helping to tell their own stories, but that talk is for another day. Because I had limited cash to work with, being strategic about who I asked to pitch in became even more important. I knew I wanted quality talent, but I didn't want to offer them sad money. So I asked friends with steady full-time gigs if they would give me a handful of days over the course of four months to shoot and edit at a reduced rate. My director of photography had benefited from others doing the same for him a few years before. My sound operator just believed in the film and didn't have any passion projects at the time. And my editor was a queer woman who had personal investment in seeing this made. Looking back, I was able to do this because I'd already spent four years in the industry working on 20 documentary projects, building creative partnerships at work, and could lean on that day-to-day -day production experience. My big takeaway from this process was that experience is a wise teacher. It takes time to learn the field, but once you've earned your stripes, you're much better equipped to take on your dreams. The last thing I learned about resources is to have scales of asks. If you wanted to write a book, who would be good readers to give you feedback? You wouldn't ask the same friend to read every page of every chapter as you write and rewrite and then do it again. So think about scales of asks. Who are you gonna ask to read the first five chapters three times over the course of a year? Versus who are you gonna ask to read the whole dang book four times across two years? There are people in your circle who are always willing to do the first one and a much smaller pool of people who are willing to do the second. So balance them out. Think strategically, leverage your resources, and use them to your advantage. I also learned that it is always easier when you lean on your networks. Networks are one of the most powerful resources at your disposal and can often leapfrog or eliminate problems a lack of money presents. It's about relationships, calling in favors, asking for introductions, cold calling with a specific ask, the horror, and hoping for people's yeses and accepting people's noes graciously. How can people uplift the work and advance it? I don't know if you've heard the joke about the Carleton Alumni Mafia, but like it is a real thing. In this case, I called up my old roommate to ask if she'd draw the animation and then my cams buddy to see if she would actually animate the segment, and they both said yes. I called my old boss and asked if he could write me intros to Smitten Kitten, Family Tree Clinic, Rainbow Health Initiative. He knew all the executive directors personally, and they all said yes. I asked a colleague who specialized in queer events whose story needed to be told, and they introduced me to queer Quaker pastor working for a trauma center with a background as a sex educator, Jessica, and they said yes. And then there are the yeses that come out of nowhere. 
I was out to brunch with alums Willie, class of 97, and Keisha, class of 2000, and I mentioned that I was looking for hospital connections, that I got this project off the ground. I knew Keisha was a doctor, and I wondered out loud if she knew anyone who could speak to Hennepin Healthcare's approach to gender and queer affirming care. And she and Willie looked at each other knowingly, and she laughed telling me that she co-led the gender clinic <laughs> at the Hennepin Hospital System. She introduced me to Dr. Haley Veazey and all the people who let me film on that third floor hospital lobby without a lawyer. And all of them said an enthusiastic yes. They were also the first hospital to host a screening after the film came out. Ultimately, you gotta shoot your shot. People can only say no if you ask, but if you don't ask, they will never say yes. I'm gonna say that one more time. People can only say no if you ask, but if you don't ask, they will never say yes. Give them the chance to say yes. You ask, you learn, and you say thank you. When you've been thorough in thinking about audience and resources, when you believe in your work, and people believe in you, yeses are a lot easier to find. I will caveat, there were plenty of noes along the way, but there were enough yeses for me to stand in front of you today. The biggest reminder I got while making Patient No More was that it is a law of the universe that no matter how well you plan, the only thing you can count on is surprises. So what was my surprise? <laughs> In December 2018, I got in a nasty car accident that shattered my right arm and wrist and partially amputated my pinky finger six months before the film was supposed to premiere. I had to go on medical leave for four months and attend 100 physical therapy sessions over the next year to regain function in my dominant hand. And that was a real oh shit moment. Hindsight being 2020, I can promise that when you encounter surprises, you can only make choices based on the options that you see at the time. Maybe it's corny, but I had a nevertheless she persisted sticker above my desk while I was doing this and editing this film filled me with joy. I loved hanging out with my interviewee footage between PT appointments. So at the time, resiliency won out, and I edited the film left-handed and premiered six months later on schedule. <laughs> it's still absurd to me, I'm sorry. <laughs> My go-to phrase as a production manager was always have a plan so the plan can change. But when the car accident happened, I had to take a hard look at myself and my film project and apply my witty wisdom to myself. I felt really stuck because I thought through my original plan so thoroughly and from every angle. And at the time, I fell face first into the trap of believing that the original plan was the best way to do it. Thankfully, I had friends around me to remind me of my own advice. The plan can change. I don't know about you, but that is not what I experienced very often in school. It was either you submit it on time, or you don't, <laughs> and you do not get credit. <laughs> the important thing about the real world is that a lot of the time, deadlines aren't real. So you need to look for the third option. Instead of I must or I will not submit it on time, Consider, can I submit it later? Can I do it differently? Can someone help me do it? When life happens, it really teaches you to say, with all due respect, screw the plan. I'm the priority. Getting the film out into the world in 2019 meant that I had to accept help, and often. This is something that independent Carls are not always very good at accepting, but it is something we are always willing to give. And so when the going gets tough, I encourage you to say yes to yourself, to your friends who want to help, 
and give yourself grace. Don't worry too much. There will be huge disasters, and it doesn't mean that you can't come out on the other side. It took me seven years to go from the idea of patient no more to this stage today. It took a lot of no's turned yeses, community support, and practical tinkering. It took learning that we always think of audiences and resources and networks as coming last or later, but they really come first. Understanding that meant that I could build a clever, strong, and flexible foundation from which to start a long-term endeavor. And seven years on, I can confidently say that the secret ingredient to achieving your dreams is giving yourself grace. You were doing all of this for the first, maybe, second time. You will be constantly learning, and that is a good thing. But to learn, we need to be able to fail, fix, and try again. And that process relies on grace to navigate the surprises, disappointments, advice, and successes. So with this in mind, my final piece of advice if you want to start on your dream tomorrow is to look around you. Partner with other dreamers. Lean on your friends. Accept their help when they offer. But celebrate the little and the big milestones together. Invite people in. Dreams are long roads, and they are always better with friends. So, go and do something exciting in the world so that we can celebrate your dreams here next. Thank you. Thank you very much, Diana, for coming back and for sharing with us. We're going to get to Q&A in a moment. Just a couple of words we'd like to mention about Convo, and particularly Convo Lunch, and more particularly, misconceptions about post-Convo luncheons. <laughs> Number one, you need to be invited. No. You, there's an RSVP form. You are invited, if that makes you feel better, you are invited to fill out the RSVP form, and please come to Convo Lunch. Number two, I need to be well-versed and knowledgeable on the subject. No. It's fun and friendly to take part in the conversations, but you do not have to. If you had to be intelligent to attend Convo Luncheon, I wouldn't be allowed to attend a single Convo Luncheon. The luncheons are formal stuffy and you have to wear a bow tie. No. <laughs> Come as you are, whatever you're wearing is perfect. That being said, we do have room at the table for Convo Lunch today. So about the first five or so people who stampede politely up and, <laughs> and talk to me, please join us for Convo Lunch. That being said, we have uh, only two more standard convos before Honors Convo. Next week, Stephen Levitsky. Stephen is a David Rockefeller Professor of Latin American Studies and Professor of Government at Harvard University. But enough out of me. Let's have some Q&A and comments for Diana. Who would like to begin? It's always hard to be first. Where? Oh, sorry. Hi, oh, hey, <laughs> Hi. I'm Dia. Um, my question, I'm, I'm really struggling to ask because I feel like it's kind of dumb and ignorant and naive, but I nope. have a pool of friends that have no clue about these type of things. So how should I define queer to them? Mm. If it's appropriate to be defined. Yeah, um, I usually say that queer covers everything under the rainbow which is a little hokey, but I like it. Um, but I think generally speaking, I use queer uh, to, to share that this is an umbrella that fits both gender and sexuality, which I think people really don't understand very often, um, and that they are not one and the same. Um, and that queer as a term was often used as an insult historically um, and was reclaimed, I would say, probably early aughts is about the time that I started hearing it pretty frequently. Um, and I use personally, which is what I'll speak to, um, to kind of cover range, I say that I identify as bisexual, pansexual on the queer spectrum because it is a spectrum. We don't necessarily identify the same way across our whole life, although some people do. Um, and you can move across that spectrum as feels correct to you. Um, but ultimately, it is about identity. It is about being able to name things for yourself um, and not need to bear the weight 
of everybody else's societal expectations about your gender or your sexuality. Um, and it gives us room to breathe, maybe for the first time. Hi, Diana. Hi. Um, for everyone else, my name is Anne. Uh, I used to work with Diana at TPT, Twin Cities PBS, and I still work there now. We used to take the bus together to work, which was always very fun. And I remember at the time, I think you had the idea that you wanted PBS to um, stream it and broadcast it and like have it be a part of that system. And so I was wondering if you could talk a little bit, I know it's probably a long process, but like a little bit about making that happen. Um, yeah. Yeah. Um, so some of that started very early on when you're like sitting down to go, I want to make a thing. What is that actual thing, right? Like there's the story part, but like what is the format of it? How long is it? Do you want it to go to Sundance, which is a very specific type of making and a very specific audience to receive that kind of film? Or do you want it to go somewhere else? And in my case, I wanted it to go somewhere else. I wanted it to go directly into education spaces. I wanted this film to be useful and programmable, which generally means um, leveraging PBS is a great way to do that. It's synonymous with education, um, as well as public access. And so when I was starting, I was like, well, I work for TPT, which is helpful, but uh, they're not gonna like just take my movie because I work there. That's not how they do it. Um, but can I maybe work with some broadcast crew in order to make sure like they know what the rules are, they know what it needs to be exported like. Good Lord, deliverables are the worst part of the world, guys. Um, but <laughs> they know what it needs to be exported and which format and how many times. Um, so how can I kind of seed that early on if I do want it to go to PBS? PBS means it will probably have to go out on broadcast as well as streaming, which is great but then you have to make for broadcast. And broadcast generally format wise, this is a little in the weeds, but um, there's a cold open, which is the like, why are we making this documentary? And like, let's intrigue you so you stay with us for 55 minutes. Um, so that's kind of the start. And then they really are very sectioned because you're learning, right? You need to kind of build your, your narrative as you go. Um, and so I decided to also section mine so that you did build towards something at the end, but also, so that um, medical professionals who wanted to do continuing education, medical professors who wanted to maybe introduce this in a classroom and then have a, a discussion about it, um, could take like a seven minute segment and push play and go like, great, we have a starting point now because we have no curriculum. So we're gonna start with this. Um, and so it's also sectioned out by about like five to seven minute chunks, I would say. And so there's coming out to your doctor, there's um, trans health care, there's mental health care. Adrian did a great job of introducing this earlier, so I'm probably going to forget a part of mine. Um, queer women's health care and queer pregnancy are the main things as well as like, is there hope for this situation? <laughs> no one wants to watch a documentary and get to the end and go, everything is terrible. Um, and so hope is a really important part of this narrative too. Um, and so that's kind of how we round out. Um, but so once I like made the movie and I'd exported it, crossing my fingers that they would be like, this is interesting you, and not the Minnesota interesting. I don't know if you've encountered this before. <laughs> there are two definitions for that word. Um, but that they would actually like it and want to take it. And so I spent in the spirit of no's and yeses, like, I worked there, guys, and I spent like eight months going like, hello, programming director, what do you think? <laughs> it's me again, <laughs> still me, <laughs> I'm back. Um, and eventually they said yes, just due to like volume and workload, but um, it, was, it was pretty straightforward to get it on our local channel, TPT, which goes out to the, the statewide system. Um, and then at that point, I had a mentor in the PBS system who was like, you know, have you ever heard of NIDA? Um, and NIDA is the National Educational Telecommunications Association, which is another angle of PBS um, that like, this is their bread and butter, right? They're like, how can, we, how can we teach people interesting things that they need to know about for the public good? And how can we make sure that educators can access them very easily? Um, and so I submitted it to them and just like waited for months on end. Um, and finally they wrote and they said, yeah, actually I'd love it. Um, 
and they were able to take it, and this was the really important part for me, because as aforementioned, $10,000, very small. Um, they could take it for free, which is everyone's favorite price, right? Um, and so they took it for free, and now it's licensed out to like 20, 27, or something like that. Um, but I will say, even as somebody who was in the PBS system and who works in the PBS system, it was pretty convoluted. Um, and it was a real asset to just like have the email of the person, right, that I could follow up with 900 times. Um, and also because they're not like paying for material necessarily. See again, public good. Um, there's just a little bit of red tape to go through on that process too. Um, but it took probably 2019 to 20, it premiered in 2020, the summer of 2020, pandemic, thank you so much. Um, and then it went to Nita in 2021. So it took a while, it was not a fast process. Um, but now it is available a lot of places. And the great thing is that P1 people search for it online. Like if you type queer women's health documentary, it's the first thing that comes up. <laughs> like there just isn't anything <laughs> else. Um, but so it worked out really well and also it like is doing what it's supposed to. Um, stations around the country will program it in their blocks, which is great. Um, universities are able to access it pretty straight, like without too much hoopla. Um, and then also I get to say that my film's on PBS, which is very fun, so. If you ever want to like get your documentary into the PBS landscape, email me, it will be faster. Not easier, but faster. Hi, thank you for coming today. You mentioned hope a couple minutes ago and I was wondering <laughs> if you could talk more about that and how you balanced like reality versus hope in the documentary. Yeah. When I started like writing the grants for this, it was 2016 and I thought we were gonna have a different president. So that didn't work out. But um, it kind of made the hope angle more important than it was before um, because, just because Trump became president doesn't mean that there weren't people working in this space every day really trying to champion change and doing it, right? Like we have seen dramatic strides in healthcare over the last few years as it relates to queer folks and queer access to care. It's not the greatest, but it is a lot better, especially if you're in an urban setting. Um, and there are medical schools, not many, but some that do like queer specific curriculum now. That's a huge win. Um, Family Tree Clinic up in the cities who's featured in this film does some incredible work um, doing sex education as well as programming medical curriculum with the U of M program um, and other hospitals in the area. And so it was very easy for me to keep hope in mind during this because I got to talk to all of the people who were giving me hope right? Um, all of the things they talk about are things that we can, we can do. Um, they're change that we can make and they're doing that every day. Um, and so I think it's important to remember that there are people who are fighting this fight and that we can fight it with them. Um, whether that's you advocating for and with your friends, right? If I know for one of the advice I usually give is if you're going to the doctor and you feel like you always get shut down in that space, bring a buddy. You're allowed to do that. They can have like your questions written down. When I was recovering from surgery and a little high at the time, I didn't remember all of my questions very well. And so I had healthcare advocates who came with me. Um, and like, there are small ways that we can circumvent this narrative ourselves and in our own lives. Um, and some of that is just by listening to people in science and healthcare who know these things. Um, and some of that is also just by making sure that people hear that message over and over again. So I think hope was easy to find in this documentary and that is probably the biggest gift to me that I could experience. Hi, Diana. I'm Rachel from the Career Center. And I, yeah, I speak with a lot of students who are really interested in sharing the stories um, of underrepresented voices and wanting to break into journalism. Very curious about your own experience at Carleton and how you built up those experiences for you to be able to 
get into a career at PBS? Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I always kind of said, because I entered Carleton aggressively pre-med, and then I became a CAMS major, maybe you discover things about yourself while you're in college, I don't know. <laughs> but um, because of that, and because I did a lot of like pre-med organizing um, before I switched into CAMS and working for NARAL Pro-Choice America and things like that, I kind of always build myself as a project manager who became an arts major, not an arts major who became a project manager. Um, and so I think that helped me a little bit, just like thinking about what your natural skills and inclinations are and following them <laughs> is a helpful piece of the puzzle and that just takes time to recognize and lean on. Um, but in far, as far as my coursework, um, I did a lot of independent studies. The CAMS department was very nice to me <laughs> every time I came and had an idea. Um, but I worked on a lot of people's side projects and most people, I would say, organizing was maybe not our like strongest suit as 21-year-olds, um, and organizing was one of mine, and so um, I project managed a lot of people's films, and that was very useful. Um, it got us grants our senior year, and so um, I came out of college, and full disclosure, I sent out like 400 applications and got zero bites until July. So you're not alone if it takes a while. Um, and I started in an advertising firm that uh, was an experience, is all I will say, um, and then left, and that was an experience too. Um, but at that point, I had some work experience. I'd had some grants. I'd done some of this like sideline, can I be your PA? Can I be a production manager for free? Like that kind of stuff. Again, not a system I endorse, but one that is very useful. Um, and then I called a Carl who worked at TPT and I said, you know, I've applied a couple of times and I just never get through. Can I have coffee? Can you tell me more about the organization? If there's any ways to kind of hurdle any of that? Um, and she put my resume on my future boss's desk. Um, thankfully my resume was thorough <laughs> at that point, <laughs> um, but it was enough to get in the door and to make sure that somebody had flagged. My key advice always when you're looking for jobs is do not press submit on your application until you have a referral, until you've called up somebody who knows somebody, don't do it, it doesn't pay. Um, it's a very hard thing to learn because you think the workforce and applying for jobs should be like merit based. It's an inside baseball game, I'm so sorry. It took years for me to come to terms with that. Um, but she put my resume on her desk and I interviewed. And I think the thing, I think the thing that cinched it was that um, I finished my interview and they'd been asking about managing grants and finance things and stuff like that. And I could send them budgets that I had made for this national grantor um, within the last year that I'd worked on with students at Carleton. Um, and so I had like a thing that I could put in front of people and say, I have done something like this before, and that was really helpful. Um, and, then, and then I was in, and that helps a lot. <laughs> um, and so I started as a finance specialist, which is not really something you'd think of an arts major, um, but I, apparently I'm very good at math, who knew? Um, and <laughs> became a production manager from there, and that's like budgets, contracts, logistics, timelines, none of what I think people think of in film is like the sexy stuff, um, but it's really important because you can't make anything without money or contracts, um, and built like practical skills from there that went directly into making this film, right? Um, and then the arts part was where I got to really explore in this film. It wasn't really something I'd done a lot of. Um, I'd made some CAMS projects, I'd made a senior thesis, Please do not look it up. It is not, it is not my portfolio anymore. <laughs> um, but it was a starting place and that was really important. So generally speaking, I think examples of work that you've done, even if you don't think that it's like super amazing or like good for external consumption, it's, it's proof that you can do things and that's really important. Um, and also reaching out to Carl's. We are a mafia. We will answer most of the time. And if we don't know the answer, we'll hook you up with somebody else. Hey, Diana, this has been awesome. Uh, 
I'm curious, from a production standpoint, obviously you're, you were immersed in this ecosystem of PBS and, and sort of knew the behind the scenes of production from your work there. Mm -hmm. What was maybe the biggest surprise or unexpected thing you had to navigate doing this independently outside of that ecosystem? Um, I think it was very personal for me. It was that I was taking on the title of director for like the first time and going like, oh, I, I can be that? Can I be that? What qualifies you for that? And it turns out just saying that you are one is enough. Um, but the actual practice of directing a film, right? You are representing it in all areas of work, in story, in people, in crew, in sales, in distribution. You have to know a lot of things. Um, and learn a lot of things and be humble about that. But for me, the coolest part was actually getting to make it, like being in Adobe 900 hours a day for two years um, was the best part, but you had to figure out, right? Like I know how to make a budget Tetris puzzle very easily, but like which interview goes next to the next one? I was modeling this off of um, Ava DuVernay's 13th style, and so that $10,000 version, guys, but, um, that general thing. So like, how do you put things in dialogue with one another, especially when you're considering representation and intersectionality so that they talk to each other, not across each other, and also not in conflict with one another? Because you don't want to put like a white woman's experience up against a woman, woman of color's experience and say that these are the same thing, right? You want to say that this is a conversation and this is part of that whole nuance. Um, and so Figuring that out as an artist was very cool and very hard. And sometimes you just have to walk away from your computer for like three weeks <laughs> until something new occurs to you. Um, but I feel like at the end of this, I felt very comfortable calling myself a director for the first time. Um, and I felt comfortable calling myself an artist. And that was a very cool graduation point for me. We have time for one more question, if that's okay. Mm -hmm. You get it. Hi, thank you so much. Your talk was amazing, and I like. I sincerely appreciate all that you have done. Like, thank you. it's crazy impressive. I guess I just have one brief question about how your documentary impacted the people who you interviewed, because. Mm -hmm. I myself am not part of the LGBTQ plus community, and as a straight white man, mm -hmm. I'm obviously, you know, I don't have the same perspectives. Mm -hmm. But I have a, an amazing mother who is a healthcare professional who champions, uh, you know, LGBTQ healthcare in her workplace. And I know that she has so many sorts of struggles with publicity and media and both being represented and the impacts of that representation on her workplace with her colleagues. Mm -hmm. So I was just wondering what the effects of your documentary were and like how you made them positive for the people that were you know, involved. Thank you. Um, yeah, so the great thing is that for me, a lot of the organizations we worked with, even if they were grassroots, were kind of established. And so working with them was a legitimacy I needed more than one that they needed. Um, and so that, I think, made the exchange a little um, more even, um, as opposed to um, asking you to tell a deeply personal story yourself, about yourself, with no connection to professional background or you know, stuff like that, and kind of going like, ooh, how long is this going to be out in the world? Do, did, did what I share, do I want people to be able to find that? There were a couple of folks in the film that did have to consider that, and to me, this is like a very granular piece, but like, it's why pre-interviews are so important in documentary work, because people need to understand that you are making a movie, and it will go out in the world, and you don't really know how far it will go, and it will be of a certain point in time, and are you comfortable with that? And if not, that's okay. It would be great to have a whole bunch of people on screen that I could not have gotten because it was too invasive. It was too much. And, and the other pieces, like, um, for instance, the Somali and Hmong populations are very prevalent in the Twin Cities area. 
And queerness isn't a particularly socially acceptable piece of their cultures. And so there were a couple of folks who were out and very um, prominent and activists in this space that I reached out to and they were like, I do, mm. <laughs> there's one thing to show up to a talk that isn't recorded. And it's one thing, we're being a panel of like six people and it's another thing to be on a documentary for somebody that works at PBS. Um, and also they had some really good points, which is that they didn't want their singular perspective to reflect or represent their entire communities, which happens, right? Um, and so there were a couple of people who like on an individual level, you had to say like, think about what being in this means for you. And if you're comfortable with that, um, it also meant that like some folks have transitioned since um, we made the film and some of them, we have like changed their names and stuff like that to what they prefer to be called now. Um, and other folks were just like, don't worry about it. That's who I was when you made the movie. <laughs> um, and that's okay too. So there's some like structural considerations to personal life and then professionally, I think it was pretty much fine for most of them because they were already acting in this role. Um, I think the person that's most surprised that it went as far as it did is me. <laughs> um, and so it's had really direct impact on me, but it's also tried to seed support and resources back to the people who are in the film. Every time that I do like a panel or a screening, um, I'm like, we need to pay honorariums and when you need to bring, if you're bringing me, you need to also consider bringing somebody either from your own medical community who works with queer issues to speak to this issue or you need to call somebody up in the film, right? Like this is meant to benefit everyone in this space and I am not a healthcare practitioner um, and we need to be seeing queer folks who are healthcare practitioners who are leading in this space as the face of this movement um, and the people who are doing the work. And so my job is to elevate that and make it visible maybe to folks who don't necessarily occupy this space on a daily basis. Um, but rising tide lifts all boats, right? And that's, that's what we're going for with this. Thank you very much, Thank Diana. You. Thank you all for being here. That brings convocation to a close. Thank you once again. And you can email me, genuine invitation. I'm on the alumni directory and that's my professional website. So if you have other questions, just hit me up. Thank you guys.